I welcome Matthew. Matthew, are you there? Hello. Lovely. So we're good to go. Over to you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Under the Skin tasting on Sauvignon Blanc. I'm going to answer a question very early on in that why, as the only buyer who has never bought a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc for the Wine Society doing a presentation on Sauvignon Blanc? Well, it's a very good question. Um, I've been doing these grape guides on our recent magazine, uh, 1874. So we've done Chardonnay, we've done Pinot Noir, Sauvignon Blanc is in the current edition, um, and we've got one on Syrah coming in the new year. And uh, it's a great way for people to get to know a major grape variety, in this case, Sauvignon Blanc. Um, but this time we thought that we would do an event alongside it as well, which I was delighted to do because I love Sauvignon Blanc. I, I am the ultimate wine trade cliche in that my first kind of wow moment in wine was tasting Cloudy Bay when I was about 13 in a restaurant because that's the sort of thing that my parents did. They gave me teaspoons and little glasses of of, uh, of booze when we were in restaurants just to kind of teach me a little bit. And uh, I just thought, wow, I did not know wine could taste like this. Um, and that was many, many moons ago, but it definitely instilled the love of Sauvignon Blanc um, into me. But it's one of those great varieties that it seems to be a, hating Sauvignon Blanc seems to be like a rite of passage in the wine trade. And so no matter where you go, certainly around the UK, you go to trade tastings, you go to restaurants, you go wherever, and everybody seems to take massive pride in slamming Sauvignon Blanc, which I think is really unfair. Hopefully I'll be able to turn the tides tonight. And if there's any kind of Sauvignon skeptics out there, hopefully you've grabbed a bottle from my selection in 1874, which is out at the moment, um, of which all of the wines we're tasting tonight are featured in. Uh, I'm aware that one wine has been delayed, the, the Doisy Dame. So I apologize if, um, if you haven't been able to get your hands on that, but having just tasted through the fight of the wines, it is really bloody good. And so after this, when it comes into stock, grab yourself a bottle because it's it's seriously smart okay let me share my screen because as always i've got a presentation um can people see that yeah great cool that's the title fantastic so as always it's good to kick off with a little bit of history so you know where does sewing and blanc actually come from well it originates from Western France, and so it's unclear exactly where, but the most likely is from the Loire, where it's a, where it's a huge percentage of planting, or perhaps Bordeaux, but the Loire is, is the most likely. Uh, the name itself is derived from the French sauvage and vin, so sauvage meaning wild in French. No, it's not a Johnny Depp uh, perfume brand, which I guess it is. Uh, and I still laugh whenever I see people scribbling out the V and putting S and turning Johnny Depp's logo into sausage. I do find that very funny. Uh, and Vine, so Vine. Yeah, so Wild Vine basically is where the, the name Sauvignon Blanc comes from. And I guess it's probably to do with its incredible kind of vigorous nature. It, um, it grows like wildfire. Uh, and it's descended from Sauvignon, so the very famous kind of Jura Eastern French grape. Uh, is one of its parents. It's unclear as to what other grape it was kind of crossed with um, in order to produce Sauvignon Blanc, but um, one of its major parents is, is Sauvignon. And so that puts it in pretty good company actually, because uh, it means that its siblings with Chenin Blanc, Gruner Veltliner, uh, Verdejo, um, and pretty much any south southwestern French white grape um, so it's in pretty good company. It's a parent of Cabernet Sauvignon. You know, that's pretty cool. And anybody that slams Sauvignon Blanc, I'm like, well, without Sauvignon Blanc, you would never get Cabernet Sauvignon. So Sauvignon Blanc is one of its parents, along with Cabernet Franc, and probably explains why uh, Cabernet Sauvignon has quite a herbal um, note to it. So that's pretty cool naturally high in acidity if there's one kind of calling card for Sauvignon Blanc when you're tasting blind it's the acidity it's almost always 
very, very high. Sorry, there is a wasp about to fly through my window. That's right. Um, it's almost always very high. Um, Sauvignon Blanc is typically grown in cool to moderate climates. It's very rarely grown in hot climates, um, mainly to preserve that acidity because it is key. Uh, a Sauvignon Blanc without acidity is just pointless. And it's high in what are called methoxypyrazines. And so this is a great one to throw around at tastings. Um, methoxypyrazines are basically um, a chemical which smell herbaceous, um, kind of bell pepper or nettle, anything like that. And so I mentioned that Cabernet Sauvignon also has that characteristic. It's likely derived from, um, from the Sauvignon Blanc side. So there are a few wines which we're trying today, which are very green is the the, the nasty word. We don't really like saying green because that kind of signifies underripe, but none of these are underripe. But they do have that very bell peppery, almost capsicum sort of smell to them. And that, that's from the methoxypyrazines. And yeah, as I mentioned, it's very, very vigorous. So you really need to restrict its growth in order to get the best out of it. And that's why you often see it on pretty poor soils. So look at the grave, the kind of gravelly soils of the grave and Pesak Laonian with the, so with the sand and gravel. Look at Marlborough, which we will be. Um, again, gravel, schist, kind of river detritus, really poor soils is where it thrives and makes the most interesting styles of Sauvignon Blanc. But I do think that Sauvignon is almost like the, it should, could almost be treated like the opposite of Chardonnay. Chardonnay has very little varietal character. And so it's all about kind of the, place it's grown um, and a little bit of the winemaking as well. Where Sauvignon Blanc has got so much varietal character. It is gooseberries, it's bell pepper, it's it's passion fruit, it's elderflower. It's all of these wonderful smells and aromas and flavours that make Sauvignon Blanc Sauvignon Blanc. And then it's just up to the winemaker to really decide what sort of style you want to make. The, the actual terroir of Sauvignon Blanc Although important to keep its vigor down, make it kind of concentrated and high quality, it doesn't impact the flavor that much. We will get to that in a minute because the Loire and certain areas of the Loire are kind of one exception to that, but you don't tend to taste the terroir or regionality as much with, with Sauvignon Blanc. It's a lot to do with the winemaking style. Um, so yeah, with lots of grapes, it's the decisions in the winery which really dictate the, the resulting style. I believe anyway, for Sauvignon Blanc. The type of yeasts you use are hugely important. Do you use inoculated yeasts, which um, which project the, um, the, the natural smells and aromas of Sauvignon Blanc? Because you can get yeasts which do enhance those kind of gooseberry flavors. And I've tried a lot of great, lot of wines from other grape varieties that have been made using these yeasts, which smell of Sauvignon Blanc you know, Pinot Blancs or Grunewald Wieners I've tried that just smell of Sauvignon and you can only assume that they're probably using the similar yeasts. Or do you wild ferment? Do you use the natural yeasts that are on the grapes, on the, in the winery, on your clothes, yada, 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 to, to make a slightly funkier, wilder style of Sauvignon Blanc? Up to you. Maceration time. So typically you don't macerate white wines all that, all that long, but um, certainly in the new world, in New Zealand, in Marlborough, leaving the skins in contact with the juice for an extended period of time, pre, post fermentation, does make a huge impact. Um, and so, yeah, it makes the wines more concentrated, it makes them more perfumed, it makes them more aromatic, it makes them super intense. Um, so yeah, if you want a really perfumed, extreme style of Sauvignon, you might want to leave it on the skins for a bit. Fermentation temperature is hugely important higher the ferment temp fermentation temperature, typically the less fruity so kind of uh, herbaceous flavors that you get. And so, um, yeah, ferment it cool and you get more of those pungent aromatics, more of those intense aromatics. Um, whereas, but slightly warmer, typically warmer in the Loire, fermentation temperatures cooler in the, Nord in the Southern Hemisphere. Fermentation vessel, typically Sauvignon Blanc is fermented in stainless steel to preserve those aromatics. You can always, you can also keep control of the temperature, which is hugely important, as I've just mentioned. Whether the wine goes through malolactic fermentation, again, hugely important. Most 
New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs will probably go through Mallow, um, whereas in the Loire, they might resist it. And maturation vessel. So thankfully, we do have a little bit of a difference with some of the maturation vessels here today. And so we've got um, majority, majority stainless steel for maturation for a very short time before bottling, but then the Doisy Dane at the end, which I know hasn't been in stock, I'm sorry, um, that is fermented in oak and matured in oak. And there is a serious difference. And then blending. All of the wines that we're talking about tonight are 100% Sauvignon Blanc. However, Sauvignon Blanc is often blended, particularly with Semillon, possibly with Muscadel in Bordeaux, in Grave or Pesac Leonien. Um, and so again, these are little tricks and stuff that you can do because Sauvignon Blanc isn't a hugely full-bodied white grape variety, whereas Semillon can add weight and it can add botrytis as well if you're making Sauternes or Barsac. So loads of different you know, things you can do. Right, enough enough whiff waff. Let's let's have a let's have a drink. Um, I'm delighted that Catherine's got all the wines today, apart from the Doisy Dane, and so we're going to kind of taste together and discuss the wines because I like talking to someone when I do this, and I think you know she's great. And so it's a shame not to. It's a Friday night as well, isn't it? It's Friday <laughs> night, so you know having a few people drinking a drinking a glass of wine is perfect. And so, cheers. We've got the first wine in our glass, which is uh, from the Loire. This is from Touraine, and it's from a Domaine de la Renaudie from the 2020 vintage, which is quite a warm vintage. And so, uh, interestingly, all of the wines today, um, apart from the Doisy, it's the, the Loire wines, which are higher in alcohol. And the Sancerre is 14%, which is pretty high, but I don't think you can feel it. Um, so, yeah, a little bit about this wine. So it's from Touraine. Touraine is like an overarching appellation in the Loire. It's this kind of big brown patchy bit here. Uh, and it includes sub appellations such as Chinon, where some of the finest red wines in the Loire are made. Bourgogne or Saint Nicolas de Bourgogne as well. Oh, I've gone too far. Sorry. How do I go back? Um, previous, sorry. Um, and then also Vouvray is in terrain as well, where some of the world's greatest Chenin Blancs, whether it's dry or sweet, um, are made which is pretty cool, uh, but it's a pretty big area. And so this wine is like a, a wine of the region. So it's using grapes from around the area. And what you should get from Terrain is a very nice, clean, fresh, um, supple version of, of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, AOC rules in Terrain do dictate that you can use 20% Chardonnay without declaring it on the label. This doesn't have any Chardonnay in it. So this is 100% Sauvignon. But Chardonnay might be added to just round out the body a little bit. Um, <clears throat> or if you know there's been rot and, um, and Sauvignon might have been attacked and you add less, you might top it up with a bit of Chardonnay. Um, so that's where we are on the map. These are the people that make it. Catherine, are you, are, you, are you tasting? What do you think? What do you smell? I am. So I don't know whether it's because it's the, uh, the first wine I've had today or whether it's just because it's the, oh, sorry, but an aeroplane going, whether it's the um, wine I've looked forward to after a quite unexpectedly hot day. But I think the first thing that comes to mind is just how refreshing it is. Yes. And the acidity, it's really, it's really quite woken my mouth up. It's really, you know, pepped me up for this, um, this event this evening, but it's very clean. It's very precise, I think. Yeah. And I think, um, we're talking about style that you typically get in the Loire versus the New World regions we're looking at today. The Loire is typically less um, overtly aromatic mm -hmm. uh, than some of the New World styles. They're typically a little bit softer. They may be higher in alcohol. Um, the acidity is brisk and bright, but it's almost rounded on the palate as well, which I really like. Um, it means that although it's invigorating, it's not overpowering you know you're having a glass and you're still feeling like oh I could have another one it's, mm. it's quite moorish it kind of keeps you going um, and also the Loire loads of chalk loads of kind of silex um, and so you get and kind of Kimmeridgean as well and so you do get quite flinty quite mineral styles which we'll see more with the Sancerre a little bit later mm. um, but yeah I think it's a really nice classic Sauvignon you know, at the end of the day, this is this is not an expensive wine. If I go back to the um, thing, what is it, nine fifty? And so you know, 
I think Moorish is exactly the right way to describe it. Your mouth waters just enough yep. that, you, that it gets you ready for the next sip. It's mm. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's the classic um, kind of Sauvignon pairings. You, know, you could have this with some smoked salmon. Lovely with, you know, the big C word coming up, Christmas coming up, you know, some smoked salmon on Christmas morning with a glass of this would be lovely. Any sort of fish you throw at it will be absolutely glorious. Yeah. Um, so goat's cheese as well. Yes. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of those things that I am a big believer that red wine just does not go with cheese at all. No matter mm. what the red wine is, no matter what the cheese is, it just doesn't work. Whereas Sauvignon Blanc works with a lot of cheeses. Goat's cheese, mo the best goat's cheese is from the Loire. Um, and so that kind of almost drying your mouth out cheese, um, like goat's cheese or like really sharp cheddar, these sorts of Sauvignons work really, really well. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's very Moorish. So there's a family on the left-hand side. I would have picked, I was looking at this earlier and I thought, if I was doing a promo shoot for my winery, I would make sure that the vineyard is like pristine, like lovely green leaves, lovely juicy big berries on the bunch. But um, so I think it must be autumn because it looks a little bit tired, doesn't it? But um, anyway. The wine's lovely. And then on the right hand side, um, you've got a dog. You need to have a winery dog in all of your pictures. Um, so this, I guess, is either cleaning the tank or post post fermentation. So you've got the kind of, I guess that's concrete on the left hand side with kind of a steel cap. And so you've got an inert vessel. So no oak flavor flavorings whatsoever. And then um, kind of a gravity fed down into a big stainless steel tank here where it will probably age on the leaves for a, for a short period of time. Um, before bottling and so keeping those nice fresh fruity characteristics lovely should we change pace a bit cool so from the Loire we're going to Chile now this is the society's Chilean Sauvignon Blanc it's from Limery which is which is way in the north of Chile now Chile is a crazy crazy place in that as you all know, it's what the longest country on the planet is 3000 miles long, but it's not very wide at all. Um, and it's fun in that actually pretty much the further north you go closer to the equator, almost the cooler it gets, because Chile has two major moderating influences. It's got the Pacific, which actually is a very cold ocean. It's around 14 degrees. A lot of people think the Pacific is hot because you see people in, you know, California swimming in the, the sea or whatever but actually it's, it's bloody freezing um and then you've got the andes mountains to the east and so um you've got these two huge moderating factors and they say that you know with climate change and the warming of of the globe in the there's two things you can do either head to the coast or head to the mountains and chile's great because you can do both um and in limery um because basically as we'll see from the map i've got a good map so limery is um uh, um, where am I? I've lost my place. Can I even see? I can't even see the words. You're just, yep, yeah, down a bit. Uh, yes, there you go. Sorry. <laughs> yes, so it's just south of the El Elkie Valley. There you go. Uh, and so the um, the key thing here is that with Chile, there's like, um, there's a big mountain range actually just on the coast. And there's this huge central valley where a lot of the kind of more affordable mass produced wines made we'll see i've got a I've got a google maps or google earth bit in a bit because i love google earth um and then you've got the andes on the round side um and so it's almost like two walls between a big valley um whereas with the limery there's very little um mountainous range on the coastal side and so it draws in a lot of the cool air and so actually limery is cooler by the coast and then warmer as you go further inland um and so yeah but um, like around in terms of like the, the soils, Limery is also quite special in that there's quite a lot of limestone and limestone typically makes quite fresh, quite aromatic, quite a light start of wine. Um, and I think Chile will be a very exciting country going forward because there is a plethora of exciting soils and terroirs like around Santiago. Um, there's on, in the Maipo Valley kind of the yeah. the around the, the, the brilliant for Cabernet Sauvignon because there's lots of gravel and it's quite warm and so yeah but yeah this this kind of gives you an, an idea so this is that massive central valley 
which you can see kind of going through here. And then you can distinctly see that you're going from lovely green, lush landscape to actually quite rugged, quite mountainous, uh, quite arid, basically a desert up in the north. Uh, but it's a very cool desert. I've got a picture in a second which basically shows the only things that really grow in Limery are cacti, cactuses, cacti, um, and vines because people have planted them there and they survive. And thankfully, the, the water offshoot from the Andes Mountains helps with irrigation. Up until irrigation was basically a kind of drip irrigation was invented, viticulture up in the north was almost impossible because there's around nine millimetres per year rainfall up in the north. And a vine needs uh, 90, so not, not nine, 90, nine zero. And you need around 400 millilitres per annum um, for vines to survive. And so you needed drip irrigation or some form of irrigation. You can't flood irrigate up here because it's too hilly um, to keep your vines alive. Whereas down in the south, you can see it's much wetter. It's more tropical. Um, and so water isn't as much of an issue down in the south. So yeah, there's the picture. Cacti, cactuses, spiky things, and then loads of vineyards. I could have picked a more mountainous picture, but... Um, yeah, you get, there's mountains in the back you could see there's mountains in the back yeah so, um, so yeah um yeah, oh i need to go back sorry i'm going to go back to the picture of the wine because that's that's what we're talking about uh, so it's made from us by um tabali tabali and um this chilean sauvignon is typically very herbaceous especially from limery where it's very cool and so you should be getting kind of like the black currant leaf tomato leaf bell pepper capsicum notes but on the palate you know it smells quite grassy and quite green but actually on the palate it's it's actually really quite ripe mm. uh, and really elegant and incredibly long actually for a wine that's 775 i'm i'm impressed by the the length of the, the wine what do you think well, I would say in terms of the, I've always struggled with the black currant leaf descriptor mm. because I've never been able to find a black currant bush to be able to see what the leaves actually smell like. But for me, it, that sort of, I'm going to use the word green, but I don't mean green in a bad way. But it's almost a bit like basil, that yeah. like perfumed, yeah, green yeah, that, lushness. It's um, yeah, yeah. That's a great shout. Oh, that is absolutely spot on. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, 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 definitely. But it's it so, really it? surprising length, isn't it? Yeah, it is, isn't it? And we talk about um, in when you're doing blind tastings and you're tasting for quality, you talk about blick, balance, length, intensity, complexity. And these wines are intense. Yeah. It's, you know, you can get um, you can get kind of concentrated wines without wines that are, without being intense. Whereas these are these are intense wines, you know they've got their flavours and they are shouting them at you in spades, um, and so yeah, but yeah, basil's a great shout. And so this will probably go really well with like a tomato, like sauce, like a pasta sauce. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I guess. Um, yeah, have we had any questions about the first two wines yet? Or I don't um, think we've had any. But if you do have questions, members, do pop them in the uh, the Q and A, and we can. Yeah ask them as we go, or if you retrospectively have any on the, the two wines we've just tried, yeah, let, let us know. Let us know what you're drinking as well. Um, but I, th I genuinely think that's really delicious. And mm -hmm. I know that some people can be put off that kind of very herbaceous nose, but actually I think it's really classy. And you do get some of that mineral, chalky, smoky underline kind of from the limestone and the yeah. as well, which I think is really great. Do you think being from Chile, perhaps people are less inclined to, to go from it because they think Marlborough particularly and then Loire have, are such big players in the Sauvignon world that, you know, people are less, well, we want people to be more inclined <laughs> to choose a Chilean Sauvignon. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very possible. It's very possible. Um, I mean, Chile, uh, like Sauvignon in Chile is not a ginormous percentage of their planting. Mm. Um, and so it's not their kind of biggest export. Um, but... Um, some people may know that there is expected to be a major shortage of Bulbasovian over the next 12 months or so. They've had 
some some nasty harvests and so there is there is expected to be a serious lack of Marlborough Sauvignon over the last 12 over the next 12 months 18 months um, and although we've done very well to secure as much as we can it may not meet demand and so members people in general may have to turn to areas like Chile to get their, their Sauvignon fix and if you're looking for the Marlborough style Chile's one of the best places if not the best you can go to because it's almost more of what you get in Marlborough um, and so if you like that a little bit more is, is no harm. Just a picture there again. Cool let's go speaking of Marlborough let's go to Marlborough. Yeah. Mm. Cool so again we're going into a society zone label range we're going to the Society's New Zealand Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc from 2020. 2020 is a great vintage for Marlborough, by the way, um, for New Zealand almost full stop. Um, and uh, this is pretty quintessential. Sorry, literally just got a new desk today and I've already spilled wine on it and it's made a mark. Whoops. Um, but yeah, this is quintessential Marlborough. Uh, so it's produced for us by Villa Maria. You, we blend it every year. And um, Marlborough, in case you don't know where New Zealand is, um, that's where it is. Um, and uh, <laughs> kind of just of the southeast of Australia. And um, Marlborough is this kind of top right hand corner of the um, of the of the southern island. Uh, so Blenheim is the kind of capital of the region. Um, we can zoom in a bit there because I've got the power. Uh, and it's basically, again, this to me just shows how important Google Earth and Google Maps is for wine knowledge. You know, that is perfect. I mean, you've got all these kind of like fingers and rivers kind of going up, drawing in that cool air, giving wonderful kind of aspects for vines, lovely fertile land on the bottom, rivers. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Um so the Virau Valley, sorry if my pronunciation is awful, um, going up here, it's kind of like the northern part of, um, of New Zealand, of, of, uh, of Marlborough. And what I thought was quite fun, I did, look, I did look, find this out the other day, is that in, in the Maori language, um, the Virau Valley means, or Marlborough means, um, is, is Ke Putate Virau, which means the place with the hole in the clouds, which A, is really cool because there's loads of sunlight in Marlborough. It's got um, New Zealand's highest percentage sunshine hours. Mm -hmm. But also what's really cool is that New Zealand is, there's a hole in the ozone layer, believed to be, above New Zealand, which means that UV light doesn't have to travel quite so far during the important growing period. And you tend to get lovely ripening periods and so you know I assume for what is an ancient term to it's it's kind of yeah whether it's prophetic fallacy or whatever you call it is 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 great but you know the whole the place with the hole in the clouds I think is quite nice a because it's sunny and b because you know there is believed to be a, a hole in the hole in the ozone layer meaning you can ripen your grapes easier anyway that's my that's my nice tangent um so South Valley's kind of way down here. They're slightly heavier soils, more clay down there, which is really great for Pinot Noir. The world's greatest Pinot Noirs are grown on clay in Burgundy. Um, and then the Virau uh, Valley here, it's alluvial deposits from the, uh, from the river. It's gravel, low fertility, perfect for those kind of really pungent, intense styles of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and then the Awatare Valley, again, apologies for my pronunciation. I have been to New Zealand, but it was a very long time ago before I had my wine hat on. Um, this, this typically, I'm not saying it always does, but typically gets the more intense, concentrated Sansa Sauvignon. This is where a lot of the single vineyards are. Um, whereas Dig Dog Point, Dig Point, Dog Point, um, is, which we'll see in a minute, is kind of here. It's at Blenheim. It's right next to the airport. Um, Whereas this is from Villa Maria, and it's so it's a, it's a regional blend. So they have vineyard holdings across the whole region, and we will select parcels 
blend them ourselves to make sure that they match what we think our members want from New Zealand Sauvignon. Uh, it's very pretty. If you haven't been to New Zealand, even if you haven't been to New Zealand, you probably know that New Zealand is incredibly pretty. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous country. Just these intense hills that you've just no idea how they've been able to be that steep and still stay so green and beautiful uh, and these lovely vines everywhere especially in Marlborough and so yeah but as we know Marlborough typically produces pungent aromatic high acidic wines most of the time for the short-term drinking um, often with a little bit of residual sugar which I think this does which is perfect it makes it super I don't want to say commercial but it is quite a commercial style. Um, I think this is what, when people think New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, especially from Marlborough, I think this is what people like. So what do you think? It's very approachable, isn't it? It's very, you know, it, it takes all the boxes. It's refreshing, but it's also with that little nudge of like residual sugar, even just the perceived sweetness from the ripeness of the fruit, yeah. it's really nice on the palate. I mean, for me, it's just straight away, it's passion fruit and mango. Yeah. It's um which can be, you know, as fruits can very sweet, but also can have a little bit of um, astringency to them, a little bit of like a slight sour edge to keep the palate. Yeah, like sour and bitter. Yeah, passion mm -hmm. fruit is very bitter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely, you're absolutely right in that Sauvignon Blanc kind of almost goes along the scale from the very cool climate, herbaceous, gooseberry tart notes to the more tropical, like passion fruit. Um, and yeah, this Marlboro is, is very passion fruit. Um, mm -hmm. So it's got a longer growing season more light um, and so typically the wines are slightly riper without being alcoholic ripe um, you know I think this is 13 percent um, yes 13 percent um, yeah. I think it's really, I think it's really delicious I think it's really very good so hopefully we've got some members that have got it as well um, we've definitely got some um, Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc fans in the members that are watching this evening I just, I just don't know what there's not to like, you know. <laughs> no, that's very true. You turn, up, you turn up to a party and everyone's like, oh, pour you a glass. I would never turn down a glass of Sauvignon Blanc, certainly from Marlborough. I think it's just it's so Moorish. Yeah. You don't have to think about it so much. You know, they, these aren't the world's most complicated. Certainly, these aren't the world's most complicated wines. They are. They know what they like and they know what they do. Um, and so, but I, I appreciate that you either love it or hate it, you know. Yeah. but I think they're, they're so generous in styles that again it's how can you it's a little bit like saying you don't like trousers where you know jeans might not be your thing but a pair of joggers yeah that's your bag so but in, you know, in, my, in my in my in my original 1874 um piece my introduction was that what uh what the James Corden Nickelback and Game of Thrones season eight which I think is the last one all and Sauvignon Blanc all have in common that people love to hate them, you know. And, uh, and I, I love Nickelback, <laughs> so you know, uh, I wouldn't recommend looking up Nickelback um, if 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 you don't know Nickelback the band. But um, I think they're great, and I like Sauvignon Blanc as well. And I'm not afraid to admit it. James Corden, I'm not not keen on, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think we were scared, scared of getting sued or whatever. But I don't think I don't think he's going to watch it. I've ruined it now because I was so upset they took it out. So. Oh no! <laughs> we have had um, a question come through, and actually, it's quite good because it's where we've been looking at the different um, Google Earth um, maps and looking at the sort of the regions and talking about how areas with more sunshine produces a Sauvignon with um, a riper fruit sort of character to it. Yeah. We've had a question um, which is whether Sauvignon Blanc could grow. Um, or would grow in the UK, is the soil too fertile or would it need more heat to ripen the grapes? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's probably the latter. Um, I think that it probably just needs a bit more warmth to um, to kick off those kind of pyrazine green flavours. I think it would just be a bit too intense. Um, but also, also, England have and the UK have, have very much focused on sparkling wine production. Mm -hmm. and like it or lump it, Sauvignon Blanc doesn't make great sparkling wines, and so mm -hmm. um, it does make sparkling wines, but they aren't they aren't very good. And so, um, certainly, the focus over the last twenty years has been Champagne traditional varieties, 
with some people producing you know still wines of other great varieties which um you know i like a lot like i really like bacchus and i think bacchus is quite like sauvignon blanc um but again people slate bacchus which i think is a bit of a shame um but yeah i think it's the latter i think it's just we're not quite ready to ripen it yet um yeah. so yeah who but, knows who knows in the few in years 20 years time 20 years time i think that you know it's going to be but i think it'll be a brave person who first sticks down 50 hectares of sowing and blanc in the uk but you know it might be a trailblazer who knows yeah. Um, so yeah this is classic new zealand sowing and blanc what i wanted to do in the article and in this is to show kind of quality mm. difference and so the next wine same region same vintage but just a a step up in quality um and so if i dash through so we're basically we're going here now basically on the b of blenheim uh to where dog point are um let me just finish this so uh for those that don't know dog point um it was founded by um ivan sutherland and ian healy who met when they were working at cloudy bay like the aforementioned cloudy bay back in the 80s and 90s maybe even 70s um, and Cloudy Bay and Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc very much put New Zealand wine on the map on the wine map um, and they were working together at Cloudy Bay really got on and thought you know what let's let's start our own project let's do our own thing let's get our own vineyards and um, let's see what we can do sorry I've ruined my desk already um, and uh, yeah, so they founded Dog Point, I think in 2004. Yeah, in 2004. And um, yeah, so they bought their own vineyards. I believe the wine was made at Cloudy Bay for a while, uh, but I believe they've now got their own winery. Uh, the name itself dates back to kind of the original settlers of the region. You know, it was hundreds of years ago possibly even thousands of years ago, where there was no infrastructure, there was no fences, there were no walls. And so sheep, which are prevalent in New Zealand, if you've been to New Zealand, you'll know, um, would just roam free. And so they needed to have dogs, guard dogs to help herd the sheep and keep nasty things from attacking them. Um, but the area is so big and it's so barren that dogs got lost, went missing, went off on their own and would form their own pack and mate, produce more dogs, and they would basically become kind of a, a pack that would come and attack the sheep that they would once there to protect. Um, and eventually the settlers managed to get rid of these wild dogs um, and basically killed a lot of them. Uh, and then the area was then called Dog Point, or so the, the legend is said. Uh, and so yeah, that's where the name comes from. And uh, the grapes of this wine are selected from six of their own vineyards in the Viral Valley, so that northern area, which I previously mentioned. Uh, and these, these grapes are whole bunch pressed. Um, and then they spend a bit of time cold settling on the, on the skins uh, before fermentation. And then they age for four months in stainless steel. I should have mentioned all the wines so far are stainless steel, cool ferment, apart from the Loire. Um, well, cool ferment, probably about 12, 13 degrees, just to preserve those fresh aromatics. Um, uh, and so, yeah, this, this is where the winery is. Um, and I imagine that a lot of the, the vineyards are kind of around this area here. And literally, that is the airport, like right there. It's very close to the airport, but the airports in New Zealand are a different story. They are, they are tiny. They are very small. Um, here's the gang. Um, so yeah, there's um, there's Ivan and James with their respective wives um, in the Dog Point car, which we have here. Again, autumn pictures, you know, not as pretty, but that is pretty, but perhaps not exactly full grape growing time. Um, I do like. Uh, and so yeah, I will I will address. Uh, well, actually, let's taste this wine first. What do you think? Very savoury in comparison to what mm. we've just tried. Yeah. Um, almost. I almost want to say a little bit saline, a little bit salty, but 
like a preserved lemon sort of flavor to it. And then on the nose that, you know, the, the struck match, that flinty quality, it's just, there's a lot more going on, isn't there? Yeah. It's very, you know, the others have been quite, quite broad and round. This is like dagger straight. It's very precise. It's very pristine. It's very clean. It's smoky. It's saline. It's savory. It's, slightly yeasty it's gooseberry yeah. it's good it's very tart it's concentrated it's long but it's it's like an arrow isn't it rather than mm. with some of the others they've been a little bit more rounded so it's very intense um but yeah the um the struck match thing is is something which is quite prevalent in in the new world or at least it has been um it's becoming less so now, which 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 I think is a good thing. Um, it's basically kind of the opposite of oxidative. It's very inner winemaking, lots of stainless steel, bottling under screw cap. It stops oxygen coming in, which means that sulfur can't blow off. But it's 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 a very trendy style. Like I like that reductive, flinty style, certainly on Sonia Blancs and on Chardonnay as well. Um, it's a trend that's starting to decrease, certainly with Chardonnay. It's fascinating, actually. We do um these big wine tastings called Wine Champions, which Catherine, obviously, you know about because you helped out this year. Mm. And um, for yeah, it's a big blind tasting. For those that don't know about it, we taste about a thousand wines between us buyers blind every year. And it's a great way to find out the trends of wine regions or styles or great varieties each year. Two years ago, in 2020, we were all complaining that the New World Chardonnays were too reductive. They were too flinty. They were too smoky. They didn't have any fruit character. Whereas this year, it was totally different. The New World Chardonnays absolutely romped home and crushed a number of Old World Chardonnays. And they were really open, elegant, and really, really bloody good. And I think Sauvignon's going a similar way. Some Marlborough Sauvignons can be very reductive and they lose some of the fruit. Um, but this one, I think, has got a good balance. Uh, I know that we've had a comment about the Section 94, which I will talk about now. So Dog Point do a, another wine called Section 94, which is their wild ferment, barrel fermented, barrel aged Sauvignon Blanc, which is a bonkers wine it is really crazy um it's very struck match almost excessively um it's very intense it's very smoky it's very reductive um and i know i, I believe the comment i'm sorry if 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 this, I believe the comment was a, a negative comment saying they didn't like it, their friends didn't like it, and I totally, totally understand that. Uh, I believe the vintage you tried was 2018. My simple comment would be it's far too young. Like, I, I drink there something of 2021 to 2028 or something like that. You can drink it now. You'd need to chuck it in a decanter and really like that style to, to like it. Um, but realistically, I think it needs it needs longer. Um, so with with wines like that, um, it's basically the the SO two, the sulfur, which uh, sulfur dioxide, which is which is causing it. Um, with wild ferments, when you're using the native yeasts, um, you don't want to add sulfur during the winemaking process because they will kill the natural yeasts and it will make the and you have to inoculate in order to keep the fermentation going. So you don't want to add SO2. You want to keep a lot of solids in your ferment, um, which increase the number of volatile sulfur compounds in your ferments. So you're going to get a sulfur aroma anyway. Um, and then you don't really want to add, and with, with oak, you're probably wanting to add some sulfur as well because oak is breathing, it's letting oxygen in, but you're wanting a very inert style. So you're wanting to add sulfur during the maturation. And then you're probably wanting to top up during just before bottling, and then you're capping under screw cap. It can't really go anywhere, and so you're probably left with quite a lot of free SO2, which kicks off this very smoky gunflint aroma. Um, and I was intrigued to see what other people thought about that wine. I went onto Jancis's website, and you know, Jancis, not not you know, so, so you will, but um, she was like intense struck match, like overbearingly intense but she was like I like that style so I've given it a high score whereas some people 
really find it averse and some people you know think they're they're if, especially if we're, if we're asthmatic it seemed as 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 quite a negative thing um although there's a lot of debate about that which i won't go into because it's <laughs> a discussion. um but um but yeah if you like that kind of oaky almost intense flinty style the section 94 from dog point is really great and actually when i was putting together the offer for the 1874 magazine i had that in it instead of this wine because i wanted to show that wild ferment that oak characteristic on sauvignon blanc from new zealand but we just didn't have enough stock of it and so i, I put this in instead because i wanted to show kind of the quality difference instead uh, and i think this is a wonderful wine we're not um, talking about this one this evening, but in terms of the um, the grey wacky wild ferment as well, how would how would you say that it compares to the um, ninety four, the dog point ninety four, in terms of the the sulphur and that strap Could, match? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the grey wacky wild sees any oak. I don't think it does either. And personally, um, having had the the grey wacky, I don't think it is as struck match as um as the 94 so i would suggest if you want to kind of ease your way in yeah. go with that one and then, and yeah, then yeah. move on to the dog point yeah they're both lovely wines they're both lovely wines um it just yeah so so and an oak is is a is an odd match mm. you like it or you don't um but definitely if you've got some section 94 uh, I, I believe we've got some Section 94 in our warehouse, which is either 2014 or even 2011, which we are, which we are still not releasing yet because it's still so sulfurous. Yeah. It's still so intense that it's just nowhere near. Um, and so, yeah, the sulfur stops oxygen coming in, which stops the development of the wine. Mm. And so, yeah, we are still holding back. I can't remember which, which, which finish it was, but it's a, it's a pretty old vintage, but it's just not there yet um it's still pretty intense yeah. but you know it's interesting i suppose um but yeah the great that gray wacky wild is really good yeah um how are we doing for time should we, should we move on to we're the doing, next one yeah we're doing great for time um we've actually had a question just while we're kind of still in new world um sort of area of, of the yep. world we've had a little question about um we've had a couple actually about some other regions and we've got one from Tim about any sort of Californian Sauvignon Blanc and there was a question a little earlier on about some of the Sauvignon Blanc coming out of South Africa as well. Oh, yeah um, okay California first um, I think there is a South African uh, a, a Californian wine in the 1874 thing which I've written um, typically the big thing back in the 80s and 90s was Fumé Blanc which was California's oaked Sauvignon, um, which is is less seen now, and we don't sell any at the moment. But typically, Californian Sauvignon is riper, fruitier, more towards that kind of tropical style, softer acidity, um, but still really very nice. Um, there's not really any great kind of California Sauvignons. It's not really seen as one of their kind of strings to their bow but there is very good approachable tasty Sauvignons from California knocking around um, especially kind of from the Central Valley um, and so yeah Peltier Ranch do quite a good one I, th mm. I think that's them anyway uh, I think that's the one that's in the offer um, so. we've got a new one as well I think I've just um a Fry Brothers from the Russian River Valley oh I've not tried that yeah, so that's okay. a, another interesting one. I did it. not know there was much much Sauvignon Blanc in Russian River Valley. That's very interesting. No, from uh, Sarah's description, it sounds like um, it might be a little bit more in keeping with Marlborough. So it's got the sort of passion fruit and pineapple and yeah, um, a bit of elderflower there. So that's sure. one that I'm definitely going to try. Yeah, I mean, I've, no, I've never had a Sauvignon from Russian River Valley. Normally it's Pinot. Um, and so, def yeah, I'd love to give that a go. I wish I'd known about it so I could put it in this offer because that is probably, <laughs> how much how much is it? It's probably quite expensive. It is uh 14.95. Okay. Which is good, which is good, but um I needed something sub 10 pounds I think so. Uh, yeah. Um uh, and then South Africa, yes, I uh, I believe there are two at least two South African Sauvignon Blancs in the article I've written. Have I mentioned I've written an article? Um <laughs> so, um yeah, there's uh I can't for the life of me remember the 
the the, the, the cheaper one. Um, but the more premium one is one called Takara, uh, which is from Elgin, which is one of South Africa's very trendy, very cool regions at the moment. I think cool, trendy and cool, cold. Uh, and that is like a razor sharp Sauvignon Blanc. It is super stunning. It is really concentrated. It is very elegant. Um, and yeah, like a, it's cliche, but I always find South Africa is a perfect meld between the classic old world and the Southern hemisphere, like Marlborough. So if you're looking for a between Loire and New Zealand style, South Africa is a great way to go. And that Takara is, it's about 20 quid a bottle though. So it's, it's not cheap, um, but it's really good. Um, yeah, there's lots of good South Africa. So lots of good Sauvignon coming from South Africa. I don't think it's, I don't think it's their best grape, but there's very good styles. Yeah. No cool. Should we, should we, should we take it home? Should we take it back to the Loire? Yeah. Cool. So skipping through this again. Right. Sancerre. You know, classic. This is Sauvignon Blanc, isn't it? Sancerre, surely. Um, so this is the site of the exhibition Sancerre. It's made by Domaine Serge Lalou. 2020 vintage again. So warm vintage. As mentioned, this is 14%, you know, which which is a which is high for Sauvignon, but I think it carries it really well. The good thing about Sauvignon, as I mentioned, is that it's got the acidity. So it still remains fresh on the palate. Um, and this, I mentioned wine champions earlier. This was a champion in, uh, in this year's wine champions, just because it's got so much elegance and concentration and character and weight and when you're tasting you know like a hundred Sauvignon Blancs and a lot of them are very brisk and fresh and refreshing and then you get one that's just got real power and sticking point to it it's it's great um, and so what's interesting about Sancerre I suppose is that you know we were in terrain earlier which I guess you could kind of class as the middle of the Loire Valley Sancerre is, is all the way over here. And we are talking way into France. If, if you don't know your French geography that well, then, you know, I don't either. But this is this is closer to the Côte d'Or than it is to, to Muscadet. Now, this is about 50 miles away from Chablis. And so this is continental France. This is slap bang in the middle. Uh, and so it's warmer. It's probably drier. Uh, and you make far more concentrated, intense styles of Sauvignon. Um, so Sancerre is, is on the kind of western bank, and then you've got puy sur loire over on the east, which is where puy Fume is from. And um, yeah, here you've got kind of a mix of a mix of terroirs. And so you've got kind of chalk, you've got limestone, and you've got flint as well, which all combine to give really interesting character. And this wine is a blend basically from all three different types. Um, but uh, yeah, it's basically one of the Loire's most easterly um, vine growing areas. And funnily enough, pre Phylloxera, so pre kind of 1860, 1870, Sancerre was predominantly red wine. Um, it was predominantly Pinot Noir and Gamay. Um, but then also, there was hardly any Sauvignon Blanc planted in Sancerre before Phylloxera. It was all Chasselas. Chasselas. And so um, it was a, pre a post Phylloxera where Sauvignon really took hold. And now I think about 20% of, um, of Sancerre's wine production is red wine, um, which is more than I thought it would be, actually, because you don't see too many... Sancerre Rouge out there, um, which is interesting, I suppose. Um, but Sancerre should be, it should be quite full. It should be quite textured. It should be quite mineral. It should be flinty. There should be that, that kind of gun flint smoke, but it shouldn't necessarily be from the SO2. It should be from the, the terroir it should be from the soil. I mentioned that Sauvignon Blanc doesn't necessarily reflect its terroir all that well, whereas in Sancerre and Pifume, then it, it does, it does better. And so you should get like a mineral wet slate sort of style. What do you think? Yeah, this is one that, I don't know, <laughs> members you might have noticed, I feel it's really lip smacking. The texture and the richness of it in comparison it's really like I have keep having to lick the inside of my cheeks, yeah. but it's um it is very concentrated. And 
the alcohol, noting that it is the 14%, it's very well integrated. Yeah. Isn't it? It's really nice it's, um, balanced. Yeah. I mean, sometimes like, I mean, it, it, it tastes big, mm. doesn't it? but it's not hot. It's almost like the alcohol is kind of reinforcing the fruit. It's not out of kilter. And, you know, great wine is all about balance. You know, you should be balanced. And so I don't mind high alcohol, high alcohol whites. You know, once you get up to like 15 and a half, 16, and I'm like, whoa. But for 14%, I don't mind that. That's fine if it's balanced, which it is. There's bags of fruit. There's plenty of weight on the palate, which supports it. There's a gr- it's a great finish. Sometimes when it's high alcohol, the finish can be quite hot and it can, all you can taste is like the alcohol burn, but actually it, it continues well onto the palate really nicely. Um, and I, yeah, I think it's a really, I think, I think elegance kind of, it's, it's the right word, but it's also the wrong word because it's, yeah. a, it's a, it's a bit of a beast in an elegant way. Exactly. I thought elegance sometimes makes you think delicate um, yeah. and it, it's not, it's um, maybe, maybe classy is, is a better word or it's, yeah. it's got that lovely seam of acidity that runs through it though, just sort of holding everything together yeah mm. yeah yeah i think it's really bloody good um i th- I, th- I should probably say that I'm, i probably haven't had a question about this yet but a lot of a lot of people might wonder what's the difference between sancerre and Prefume. they're very similar i mean it would take an unbelievably well-trained palette to differentiate consistently between sancerre and Prefume. typically for me i found Prefume, as the name would suggest slightly more floral you get more of that black currant blackberry leaf um and if you've if you've got the society's exhibition perfume that for me is really black currant tea very black currant fruit very leafy more so than sancerre which is typically a little bit more kind of mineral and refreshing so that's my half-assed job at describing what the difference is between perfume and sancerre uh, but realistically they're both bloody delicious uh, but if you like the more mineral styles sancerre if you like the fruitier styles proof for me shall we continue yes let's oh this is a map of france oh yeah there's chablis so i i i <laughs> I, um, I, um, I i came out to to see to show people how you know sancerre is down here so you've got the loire river which kind of goes up woo, and loops around here uh, and then, yeah, Chablis is only there. Mm. It's crazy. And Bonus is only there. It's, you know, very close to Burgundy. And Burgundy's, you know, very far east. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, let's continue. Oh, these are the people that make it. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm not very good. Um, Joe, Joe comments, Joe Locke, the buyer for Loire, always comments about how unbearably clean the Domaine Lalou winery is. And so I thought I'd stick a picture in there. Lovely stainless steel tanks. Yeah. Mm, it looks pristine, which is good. And lovely, finally, lovely, healthy vines being picked or pruned, probably, I reckon, rather than picked. It looks like pruning. Um, cool. On to our final wine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a wine that I know that not many people have, so I'll have to do my best to tell you what it tastes like. Mm. It's Friday night, so, you know, no, no spitting. Cool. Fuzzy Dane. So I know that we got a comment or a question earlier a few days ago about talking about Bordeaux as a whole, which I will do. Um, but uh, Bordeaux as a whole, typically, it's it's the one region in France where you will find oak being used quite a lot um, with your Sauvignon blogs. Partly this is speculation rather than actual fact, I guess, because certainly around the Graf, Pesac Leonian area near Barsac and Sauterne, lots of new oak are being used for your Sauternes and Barsac because it's all basically all new oak for those wines. And then you may transfer them over to use for your, for your dry wines as well. Um, so it just means you can kill two birds with one stone. Um, but also, I guess it's it's a style thing, um, and so the wines of Bordeaux typically uh, are richer, they're fuller, they are often oaked, they are often very creamy, um, they are often blended with semillon. This one is not. This is one hundred percent Sauvignon, as mentioned earlier, but they are they are very often um, blended with semillon. 
Um, but so, but Bordeaux Sauvignon under ten quid is usually stainless steel. It's usually fresh. It's usually aromatic. It's usually quite grassy, um, but very nice. Um, and so, the best thing to do: check check the winemaker, check the check the label, see if it's barrel fermented or barrel aged or not. Um, I don't know why. Can you see that? Getting messages from Daily Mail. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I've never been off the Daily Mail website in my life. Um, but <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, check check the winery because they will know best. Um, and so, but if in doubt, typically sub ten quid is going to be unoaked and it's going to be stainless steel and fresh and fruity. Um, over ten fifteen pounds, there will probably be either barrel maturation or barrel fermentation. Um, this is both. So this is barrel maturated and fermented, ferment, fermented, not fermented, sorry. Um, and yeah, it's made by Desiden, who are owned by the de Bourdieu family. Um, Denis de Bourdieu was one of the great Bordeaux vignerons, brains, full so he, he was an absolute legend. He died, I think, back in 2016. Um, and he was just a force to be reckoned with. He was unbelievable. Um, and he was a big kind of proponent for dry white Bordeaux uh, and improved the quality no end. And so Dwesley then are definitely one of the producers to go for if you want top quality dry Bordeaux, white Bordeaux. Uh, it's now run by his sons, uh, Jean-Jacques and Fabrice. Fabrice's are a lot of wine society tastings pre-COVID. He's hilarious he's brilliant he's a bit mad but he's great um and so i'm sure many members have had the chance to meet him uh jean jacques typically does a lot of the winemaking so he hides away in the winery um and but uh it's it's a beautiful 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 place it's really wonderful they did a big revamp about three or four years ago got a wonderful tasting room there lovely dining room amazing views out over the vines and and you can just about see the the tower of Ikem in the corner in Sotern, which is which is pretty cool as well. Um, so yeah, uh, the sweet wines for Dwazidane are also fantastic. So it was classed uh, a Dozium crew in the 1855 classification, um, but their planting is around 86% Semillon to 14% Sauvignon, as is pretty typical. In, in this area in Barsac. Uh, so they are based in Barsac. Uh, they also own Clos Floridaine. They own Chateau Contegril, who produce our own label, Exhibition Sauterne, which is wonderful. Um, Chateau Reynon they own, which is actually where I believe Fabrice lives, I think, uh, and a few others. And they are lovely people. We've been working with them for a very long time. Uh, the de Budio family of, yeah, of, yeah, the Wine Society legends. And this is a, a lovely wine. This was another wine champion from this year, but also it was a wine champion from last year. So this is 2019. So it's got a little bit of bottle age. It won in 2020 and it's won in 2021 as well. So that if that's not, you know, a good selling point, then I don't know what is. And um, yeah, so it's unlike the others, this is fermented in, in oak, French oak, barriques, 225 litres. And so plenty of contact with with um, with oak. You can't control the temperature as well in oak, and so it's going to be warmer temperature. So less of the kind of pyrazine flavors, more of that very tropical passion fruit, gooseberry flavors, and then fermented for 12, mo 12 months in oak. I couldn't find out how much was new. I don't think there's any new oak just from sniffing it. There might be a bit maybe 20%, um, but it is a marked character on the wine. It is savoury, it's kind of sweet cedar, there's a little bit of vanilla, which when you blend it with the slightly herbaceous character, it makes a really interesting, slightly kind of wet wool, doesn't sound very nice, but it is, um, kind of character to the wine, which I think is fascinating. And it is big and it is long. But the good thing is, this is only 12.5%. 12, 12 so it's actually the, it's a, the lowest alcohol wine that we've got in the lineup tonight. And it is the most incredibly long, concentrated, wonderful wine. I like it. Can you tell? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely one that I'm going to 
put an order in for we have got it it's meant to be in with us next week so if you are keen members you can order it now yeah. um and as soon as it arrives we'll get it out to you i think we mentioned about having fabrice at the um him being quite a regular at our in-person tastings and i think it yeah. was 2019 we had a, a bordeaux tasting um in nottingham and london i think and he was there and i tasted one of the, the earlier vintages of the um one well, of the previous vintages of this one and having the oak makes such a, a marked difference um i think it really helps was the i like <laughs> talking a lot about the kind of food pairings with wine but i really think it helps with that as well it means you can have slightly richer things things like a fish pie that's got that kind of smoky quality anyway and a richer body or as we're getting into a bit more of a cooler weather a bit more autumnal things mm-hmm. like you know chicken pies anything with a bit more of a creamy sauce that's a great shout to go with yeah we've talked a bit about the um sort of oak aging and oak fermenting Mm -hmm. or oak maturation and oak fermentation Mm -hmm. in a general sort of is it easy enough to kind of give a bit of a general descriptor of a difference between the two in what the oak gives at each stage yeah uh typically when you're fermenting an oak um I mentioned the temperature is less easy to control. And so the fruit character often changes quite a lot. It often gives quite a broader one because it can let extra oxygen in. Um, but also the oak seems more integrated. It seems more part of the wine. Um, it's more seamless between the fruit and the oak. Yeah. And then oak maturation, because you'll have probably fermented it in stainless steel, which means that you, or concrete, which means you, you retain those really bright, crisp, fresh aromatics then you mature in oak it's i'm not saying it it's it's separate but you get the sharp intense fruity flavors and then you get the the oaky flavors as well which over time will merge but they can sometimes seem like quite different things Mm. Um, that being said like no red wine is fermented in oak yeah because you need to control the temperature. And so almost all red wines are fermented in stainless steel and then transferred to oak. Um, but they will age typically for longer in oak and then they will then be aged longer in bottle post oak maturation. And so, yeah, it's really about the integration. Like with kind of tasting blind and MW studies and stuff like that, you, you are expected to know by taste whether a wine is fermented in oak or not and a lot of the time it's about the integration um and so yeah, yeah. If it's if it seems like part of the wine then it's fermented in oak and if it's kind of like an accessory to the wine then it's matured in oak <laughs> thank you that's all of the wines um <laughs> Do you have any questions? Does anybody else have any questions? Can we... We've got some questions that have, oh. um, that have come through. Um, I think going back to when we were talking about whether um, England or you know the UK has potential for Sauvignon Blanc, and we were talking about Bacchus as being a, um, a sort of, not necessarily an alternative, but a quite similar. If you like a Sauvignon Blanc, then a Bacchus yeah. is a good one to go with. So we've had a question from Melissa um, saying that she's yet to find a Bacchus for her. Do we do one? I think we've got a couple at the moment, haven't we? It, yeah. The uh, the one I would go for, if I was you, um, would be the, the a new one I brought in this year, actually. It's called Dillion's. Um, it's got a beautiful label. They are a, a brand new vineyard in Sussex. The vineyard was only planted in spring 2019. And I tried the 2019 earlier this year, and I was like, holy hell, this is good. Um but they didn't have any left. And so I tried the 2020 a few weeks after, after they bottled it. And I think it is serious, serious kit, um, especially from a, a wine, a, a vineyard that's only, you know, two, two and a bit years old. Um, it's about 16 pounds. So it's a little bit more expensive, but I would, I would say if you don't like that, you don't like Bacchus full stop and you should probably try something else. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, but because it's from 2020, which is a wonderful, quality vintage in england uh, and so it's got good weight it's got soft acidity it's not piercing like some english whites can be and it's got wonderful fragrance and it's a beautiful bottle 
which is 99 yeah. of the thing. You know. <laughs> I've just popped the link into the, the chat members, but I'll oh, send cool. that around tomorrow as well when we um right. you know, send you, or Monday when I send you yeah. your email afterwards. Um, let's have a look in terms of any other questions. Members, if you've got any questions, pop them in the Q&A now. Now is your chance. Um, let's see. We've got a question about the, the Dwazi Day and whether we'll be tasting stocking the 2020 vintage. Um, have we, do you, do you think we will? <laughs> I, I think I would be surprised likely if we, we would. Um, I, I would be surprised if we don't. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, yeah, I guess, yeah. yeah. Watch the space probably three or four months time. I don't know how much stock of the, um, the 19 we've got. I imagine quite a bit because we've probably put it in the Christmas list and... If we're, if we're still awaiting shipments of it, then I imagine there's a decent amount. But um, yeah, I, I will say with the Dwazi Dane, all the other wines you can probably serve basically fridge cold. The Dwazi Dane deserves to be served a little bit warmer um, just to kind of let the, the aromas come out. Um, treat it almost like a Chardonnay to it if you like. I, I wouldn't be averse to, to decanting it because um, it's getting better in the glass. I've had them out of the fridge now for about two hours and... Yeah, it's better now than it was. Yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't quite quick enough in getting mine in the fridge. They had a little spell in the freezer, um, so they weren't quite as cold as I'd hoped. But actually, that has helped in terms of getting the, um, you know, the, the flavours and the aromatics coming yeah. through. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah don't, don't, don't serve any of them too cold, you know. It's, yeah. yeah. And we've had a, uh, a question from Paul asking whether all New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs are bottled in the UK. Um, are the, would you know, Matthew? Are they bottled in the UK no. or some are? Some are. Um, are. As far as I'm aware, our society label ones aren't. Mm. Uh, the, the thing with bottling in the UK is, although I'm a massive pro bottle in the UK guy because it's a big save on the environment, um, the flexi tanks that you ship in are like twenty five thousand liters which is a lot, you know, we shift a lot of wine, but that is a hell of a lot of wine of one particular line to shift. And so um, we don't do that much bottling in the UK. There are definitely wines at which we do bottle in the UK or bottle in Germany or bottle in France. Um, but um, yeah, we was a lot of the lines that we do, we just simply don't shift enough of it to justify yeah. it. Um, whereas, you know, supermarkets like Aldi, um, who I am again a big supporter of, if I'm allowed to say that, um, they will ship, I guarantee, almost all of their wines in bulk, in flexi tanks, um, and they will bottle in the UK uh, because it's a lot cheaper. And it's how they can do their wine incredibly cheap because they are shifting a lot of it. Um, and, you know, but flexi tanks are great. You know, you can the shelf life of a wine starts as soon as it's bottled, basically. So if you're not bottling it until a week before you're selling it, then great. Whereas if from New Zealand, at the moment, it's taking probably three months to get a wine from New Zealand or Australia to the UK. You know, your shelf life starting five months prior. So, yeah. And I think, um, let's just finish on a, a keeping question. So we've had a question from... Um, from Tim, I think Tim Jones asking, how long did we say the Dwazi Dane will keep? Now, Tim, I presume you mean once opened, um, or you might mean as in aging, because it I'll, does I'll have a little bit of time. But um, just in general, over over all the wines, obviously, once you've opened them, they're quite a you kind know, of drink in a few days. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I. <laughs> Drink, keep them until they don't taste very good. Um, <laughs> uh, I would say that the, I say all of these, which should should be fine for at least three or four days in the mm. fridge, with the tops on, should be absolutely fine. The Dwazi Dane will probably get better for the next three four days, and then we'll probably be fine after a week because, you know, it's had some oxygen in its winemaking yeah. process. Um, I would say if, if the question was actually about how long to mature the wine for before opening it, it will be wonderful for in five years time. Mm. I think Tim Sykes is, we've got Tim Sykes's window. It's up to 
2025, I think. So you are always a little conservative. Yeah. But, um... 2019 is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful white Bordeaux, dry white Bordeaux vintage. Like genuinely is awesome. I was out in Bordeaux with Tim um, blending our society's Bordeaux Sauvignon um, in 2019. And it was like the easiest job ever. It was hilarious. They line you up with like a hundred samples normally, but this year they were just like, we've only got like 10 because <laughs> the wine is so good. And we literally just went, boom, 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 tasted it. Yeah. Bang. That was awesome. Yeah, it was great. And so 2019 is a lovely Bordeaux vintage for whites. Tim okay. just popped back and said he did mean aging. So hopefully, Tim, that has answered your question yeah. there. Yeah, I would I would definitely hold some back. So it will be mm. fascinating. If um if you don't have much if you don't have much experience with aged white Bordeaux, they go pretty funky with age in a nice way. They can get like a slightly cheesy really selling it here like it's like <laughs> like i i I think i like really nice stilton that yeah. kind of it's that creamy meets herbaceous yeah note um but delicious so yeah open it up with some stilton and you'll be you'll be cracking absolutely perfect so i think that covers everything that we've uh, been asked there so Thank you very much, members, for joining us. I hope if you are Sauvignon fans, this has just reinforced your love of the grape. And if you were perhaps sceptics at the start, you're maybe more a little bit inclined to be trying something or venturing to a, a new region. Thank you very much, Matthew, for doing this event with us this evening and also for your, your article. I think you may have done that in the 1874. Is that, is that right? Might be available to read now. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> Members, that was um, included in my email this morning that you've received, but I will pop that around for you again um, yeah. on Monday so you can do have a look back at that. And any of the other articles in 1874, it really is quite full of interest this time round. So, yes, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, members. And have a lovely evening and weekend, everyone. Have a good weekend, everybody. <laughs>